tax reform, North Korea and sexual misconduct. I'm Adam Bearn and this is The Square Circle. for helping people want to launch a new charity or need to raise funds voluntary solutions can help you have a passion for helping people we have a passion for helping you visit voluntary solutions dc.com 844-739-5488 hello and welcome to the square circle i'm your host adam Bearn. joining us today are gregory clay of gdclay.com patricia de Gennaro of george mason university and conservative writer and editor brian mcnichol good evening everyone good evening this week, the Republican tax reform plan passed a major hurdle in the U.S. Senate. Here's the story from the PBS NewsHour. This is our chance. This is our chance. Another big moment for the big GOP tax bill. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell opening debate on the Senate floor today. We will be one step closer to taking more money out of Washington's pocket and putting more money into the pockets of the hardworking men and women we represent. But Democratic yes, leader November Chuck Schumer accused Republicans of rushing to pass a flawed I bill. I, I'd understand the rush if the Republicans were sure they had a great tax bill, but they are not sure. So if the Republican tax plan is about helping the middle class, why does the Independent Congressional Budget Office say that it's going to cost people money if they don't earn more than $70,000 a year, Brian McNichol? Well, they, first of all, uh, that's not, that is a media depiction, and that's not what it is or what it should be. Uh, the, what is problem, what's going on here is there's a wasted opportunity. Uh, they've cut the corporate rate, but not as much as they should. They've got it from 35 to 20, which will make this competitive with much of the world, but we could have, like, taken the world by storm with this if we'd have gone to 15 or 12. Uh, you got to remember corporate tax. You know, if you think the corporations are greedy, where do they go to get the money to get the tax? They don't just eat 15% of profit, right? They get it out of us. They get it out of the customers, you know. So when you cut a corporate tax, you cut a tax to consumers. Um, there's this obsession with paying for it. The last hour or so, it's broken that... Um, uh, they, the uh, parliamentarian of the Senate has said that they had, a, they had a feature in the bill that if economic growth did not close the deficit a certain amount out of this, um, then they would, they would, it would trigger a tax increase. And the parliamentarian says you can't pass it like that under reconciliation where you, would, you only need 51 votes to get it across the finish line. So now they're going to have to go back and they're, they're caught up in these pay-fors, right? we got to pay for it. Well, what the, what the majority leader just said on the clip is, you know, we're trying to get money out of Washington into the hands of the taxpayers. And so, you know, the corporate tax helps. There's, you know, some rate adjustments and most people will say we'll get about three or $4,000 a year tax relief out of this uh, with a few exceptions because we're obsessed with paying for it, which we're not really going to do. Um, they, what they're saying is it adds $1 trillion to the deficit over 10 years. Um, you know, Obama added $10 trillion over eight years. So it's a pretty good bargain it's from that standpoint. Excessive. So, um, Patricia, you don't agree? No, I don't agree. I think that the war effort in Afghanistan and Iraq added to the deficit primarily because we spent all of that money on our own. And I mean, if you look at the Harvard studies that have been done on it, it's up to a trillion dollars, and this was five or so years ago. So it's not true that Obama actually. I mean, he was the added, president. Well, I think the war spent. effort added to the to the deficit, not necessarily the president. So we have to decide how we want to but, I mean, participate. Was down. It was, it was, one it was down. When yeah. was it down? Yeah, it's it's down as a percentage of GDP when, over the last twenty years. I wouldn't say $800 billion during the time of two wars was down, and right now it's around six or seven that they're fighting for in the Congress. But so. billion, if we, if which we is can, less than it was. Right. And if I mean, we can get back to this, the tax plan specifically, mm -hmm. though, Patricia, where do you think the balance lies here in the Republican plan? Is it primarily about the middle class? Or do you think it's maybe more geared towards well, uh, big there, corporations? And I think it's unfortunate because where, it, where it lies is not a discussion about what's good for the country or what's good for the people or how the tax plan can be, be um, 
definitely reformed, what, what they're doing here is trying to push through legislation to show that they're doing something. And I mean, I know we elect our representatives because we want them to do something in Congress, but we really don't want them to do things that are going to hurt us in the long run. But and the discussion around this whole tax effort is that why, you know, let's push something through, hurry up, and for the corporations, when the people also need to get that benefit in their own, you know, so why not look at a reform at a more flat rate or a more, you know, less loopholes, and that's kind of where we would talk about a more equal tax and a more equal burden on each member of society, including the corporation. So, Greg, but, but, isn't, it, but isn't all this predicated on hope? As in, what do you mean? aren't the Repu Republicans hoping, hoping for this great GDP growth? You know, because under President Obama, GDP was never more than what, 1.7, 2% or something, you know, uh, on well, average it was, it was each year. It's pretty much worldwide. And, um, recession, and the Republicans so. are promising 3.0 and above. The, and the president yeah. believes that he, they can reach 4%. Growth. 4%. Right. right. Yeah. right. They, they believe they'll reach it in the next quarter, yeah. you know, the fourth quarter. Right. Of, well, last yeah. quarter it was 3.3 in the third yeah. quarter. Yeah. And uh, so th that's what I mean by hope. And you have to wonder what happens if you lose hope. I mean, to paraphrase an old saying, the Republicans are, are essentially saying, keep hope alive, you know, to help pay for this thing. Well, you'll lose well, it's a solid record of you lower taxes at the top. Mm -hmm. You give, you know, it was, there's all these things like we got to give the money to the middle class. That does not move the economy. What moves the economy is to give it, put it in at the investor level, where well, I think the you can go class around does and make, move the and make economy, companies, sir. Um, and you you go around and you can you can build things, add jobs, mm -hmm. so forth. Where so, you know what you have now can, is 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 small ball. You have a depreciation. You've narrowed the tax base. You have a corporate cut, and you know you have fewer people paying taxes. You have right now you have the top one percent pay ha almost half of all taxes. The top twenty percent pay uh, five-sixths of all taxes. So when you say, oh, that cu tax cut benefits the rich, rich are the only people pay it. Yeah. So Patricia, it sounds I, like you I don't prefer think that's the cuts. necessarily the true because I certainly pay my taxes and I don't <laughs> fall into that 1% bracket. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when if you look at the economy of China and how it grew, it grew through a middle class um, expansion. It didn't grow really through the more wealthy or, mm -hmm. and people across the nation benefited from it. Did everyone? Of course not, because it's a different kind of system. But mm -hmm. it was a middle class growth that increased the, per, uh, the that increased the percentage growth in that country, which was up to eight percent. So is, I mean, it, I think uh, fill, you know, not not enriching our middle class and allowing people opportunities to become part of that class is putting this country at risk and won't allow us to have those kinds of funds come into our revenues and be spent within the government. The, the in Chinese order did to something we care. can't do. It's big investment in tech of their own that created the job. So they did it the way that I'm saying. They financed the big things. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll move on now, I think, to our next topic. But first, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, or via Facebook or Twitter, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show. Also this week, North Korea made its most threatening missile launch yet. Here's CBS News' coverage. The missile was fired from a mobile launcher just north of the capital of Pyongyang and flew for more than 50 minutes, climbing more than 2,300 miles into space before splashing down in the Sea of Japan. Because it was fired at such a high angle, the missile was never a threat to the United States. But calculations done by David Wright of the Union of Concerned Scientists showed that had it been fired on a standard trajectory, it could have traveled 8,100 miles far enough to reach Washington, D.C., or anywhere else in the U.S. So, Patricia DeGennaro, now that the North Koreans can apparently hit the continental United States, how much of a game changer is this? Well, I think, you know, North Korea has been a game changer for a long time, and, and I think that's partially because we as Americans really need to have a good global strategy for our foreign policy. You know, we pick enemies and we pick friends and then we pick to ignore people. And when we're ignoring people, like we've, you know, broke relations with North Korea, for example, they're able to maneuver and gain technologies that we're not able to influence or, or help control. 
Um, this particular missile is, is definitely a concern. Everything they're doing is a concern. Um, but I think we're adding to that concern by the rhetoric that's coming out of the White House. And, you know, a lot of the, the, a lot of the, um, the dialogue that's been going on now between North Korea and the U.S. are the North Koreans asking, you know, is, is this guy really going to come after us? Is this guy really going to start a war with us? Because we need to know. And so there's a lot of back-channel discussion that's going on around that. Um, I would keep in mind that most of the ballistic missiles have not reached um, the ground. They, most of them have landed in the sea, and they also, none of them have a warhead. So a warhead's going to change that dynamic. But I think we need to look at engagement. We need to look at diplomacy. We need to look at, you know, understanding how to, how to talk to and influence people. And you can't do it by calling them names or saying, you know, just threatening outright destruction of, of every of all the, everyone in your country. So yeah, Donald Trump has been getting a lot of criticism, you know, for, as uh, Patricia said, the name calling and the crazy tweets and Rocket Man and Elton John and all this stuff going on. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the key for, uh, question is, Don't what does the United States do? You know, I mean... I mean, um, what, what's the diplomatic angle on this? I mean, is there a diplomacy? I know many of Donald Trump's critics are saying that um, he doesn't seem to care about diplomacy. Um, I know, the, like the other night, uh, John Kerry, who was um, Barack Obama's Secretary of State, you know, this, uh, during his second term, said that there's a false narrative going around that diplomacy has failed. And uh, John Kerry vehemently said, that's not true, uh, and that's a falsehood. His argument is that there hasn't been enough diplomacy, hasn't been enough uh, trying with diplomacy. And he, of course, was referring to whom? One, Donald J. Trump. Well, yeah, and he also talked about how um, the United States has to push Beijing more. You know, to 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 right, and I think that has, situation. I would say we we've tried diplomacy since at least the Clinton administration. You know, Clinton gave them nuclear reactors and a bunch of money to operate with peaceful fuel. You know, create heat, so forth, not for weapons, right? Um, but you know, we've tried economic inducements. We've tried working through the Chinese. We've tried working through the South Koreans. I think the point Trump made, and I'm not sure that you know how this ends or whatnot, is. You know, we need to, you know, by not confronting them, we've allowed them to create these weapons and to create this infrastructure to make weapons, and that it's time to bring it to a head. So, because, left is war now? Nuclear uh, war? Well, I don't that's well, it. I mean, that's I, it now? Well, let's know, just I don't know. But I mean, what, no. what I'm saying is, is, is you have, um, you know, the status quo is how we got here. Try, being quiet and being peaceful and back channel communications is what got us here. So it's hard to argue that like more of that will start working. Okay, well, Patricia Dijon, let yeah. me ask you then, um, what do you make of the analysis that perhaps now that North Korea has this capability, that that's what they were waiting for before they began negotiations, and perhaps that now the window for diplomacy is open? Well, I think, you know, this comes down to how we understand other countries and how we understand how other countries are posturing themselves and then how we react to that. And, and in this particular case, you have a country that's been closed for such a long time. We've had a whole experience with Eastern European countries as well who have had, you know, have been through similar histories. And they're fearful. They're fearful from the time they grow up till the time, you know, because they're not allowed to see much beyond their borders. And so, I mean, the idea is to understand that and then how do you engage it? And threatening and confronting it is not usually the way to, to you know, tell people that they can sit down and, and, and relax because we're not going to bomb them or anything. But, you know, when you're, when you're maneuvering warships and doing war games around, I mean, if I were, put yourself in someone else's shoes, right? And I'm not excusing weapons. I don't think this is, I would rather see everybody be disarmed, quite honestly. But that's not going to happen. So how are we going to think about engaging? How are we going to think about treating that person and looking at the difference so we can impact and influence and change 
the dynamics and behaviors. But what hasn't been tried? Well, well I mean, what we, hasn't been tried? What, we also, well, we've done those what hasn't been tried is, is actually understanding your adversary, is understanding. You know, we threaten, we coerce, we use military, you know, we use and military. Bribed, we've yeah. sweetened, but well, we've bri sugar you know, and, and spice. And, and again, I'll, I'll go back to the fact that we don't develop a good strategic policy. We don't work together. We don't work comprehensively. We have the State Department doing something over here, you know, defense doing something over here, the White House doing something over here. You know, the NSA is supposed to be is supposed to be coordinating these agencies and thinking about whole, whole and smart intervention, and it's just not... At this so, time, it hasn't been capable of doing it for a very long time. Brian, let me ask you about that point then quickly. Where is America's state of diplomacy right now, given the president's Twitter habits, given that even today it looks like he's going to try and push out Secretary of State Rex Tillerson? Isn't the diplomacy coming out of the White House a mess at the moment? Um, I think it's less a mess than it was a year ago. I think it's in better shape. We are projecting strength again. You know, and it's like some people won't like that's it, not right? Policy, but though. it's but that's how you get yeah. that's how you get your aims is people understand there are repercussions to it. I just hope it's okay. not World War Three at the end, though. All right. Well, finally tonight, uh, the ongoing sexual misconduct scandal has forced out two more high-profile media personalities in Matt Lauer and Garrison Keillor. Here's how NBC reported on the firing of Lauer. We just learned this moments ago, just this morning. As I'm sure you can imagine, we are devastated and we are still processing all of this. As painful as it is this moment in our culture and this change had to happen. Yeah, it did. This is a, a very tough morning for both of us. Um, I've known Matt for 15 years and I've loved him as a friend and as a colleague. And again, just like you were saying, Savannah, it's hard to reconcile what we are hearing with the man who we know, who walks in this uh, building every single day. We were both woken up with the news kind of pre-dawn and we're trying to process it and trying to make sense of it and it'll take some time for that. So is this a long overdue change in workplace culture or is there danger of a witch hunt here? Gregory Clay. Well, yes, to me, what's going on is similar to a civil rights movement because Back that big. The, it's that big. Yes, yeah. Because back in the 60s, I've talked to several civil rights leaders about what happened in the 50s and 60s. And I asked them, why did it happen, you think, in the 50s and 60s? And about five of them, these are people who participated in the March on Washington, the Freedom Riders down south, et cetera, et cetera. And they told me um, repeatedly, because the time was right. And I think what's happening now with these sexual harassment disclosures, the time is right. And this wave is happening. The key situation is that now women are believed. Before, um, many women were not believed. You know, it happened, you know, for years. It happened early on with the Bill Cosby situation. However, I will say this. If people would have jumped on Bill Clinton, the president, when the time was appropriate, I think it would have solved a lot of the, the maelstrom, the heartache that we are seeing now. Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, Garrison Keillor, Russell Simmons on Thursday. Um, you know, I mean, these guys, some of these guys are being accused of more than just harassment. Now it's physical, as in assault and rape. And um, the feminist movement saved Bill Clinton. And... If Bill Clinton would have been caught and brought to justice, you know, in 98, 99, as he should have been, I think it would have solved a lot of the sexual harassment problems okay. in the workforce. Patricia De Janeiro, no how, how, how do you see You're not as optimistic. No, not a chance. This has been going on for years and years and years, and it's been okayed. It's been okayed by men. It's been okayed by, by you know, by supervisors, um, and I, I don't think that, the, I think the, the issue with Bill Clinton is a little different. Um, however, what I'd like to say is that I would like to see this discussion around equality and around respect for people in the workplace period. I mean, this is just, you know, I don't want, if we continue to look at this as a witch hunt or or getting revenge against men who, who behave this way instead of paying 
a price for doing it or being responsible for their actions, that's going to take away from allowing women to be valued and looked at as equal in the workplace. So, I mean, one, you know, they say one in 10 women, and I, I can, you know, speak for myself that it's probably very true and a very often occurrence. It's hard to handle it, but it is good that people are being listened to, but the message is we are valuable, we are equal, and we should be treated with respect and dignity in the workplace just like men are. Absolutely. Brian I, McNichol, I, how do you see it? I, um, uh, I agree with, uh, uh, you know, pretty much what she said. Also, um, you know, there's a, I don't think that it wasn't, people were not believed before. I believe they were believed, but they were told, shut up, you know? Right. So, which is not, not acceptable way to handle it. it or like, they, they were coerced or, yeah. or, or had threats. Yeah. 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 I mean, it seems right. like with yes. Matt Lauer, Harvey Weinstein right. and others, there right. was an open secret open that this was right. that kind oh, of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Harvey Weinstein, right. people knew for years yes. and years yes. as a former right. New Yorker. But those non-disclosure agreements, you know, as, silenced yeah. the women. They, you know, stopped the women. You know, well, it's and, also, you know, the superior is not doing anything about it. I mean, Harvey Weinstein had a board. He had right. people that were supporting his right. actions, actually. He had a, a lawyer mm -hmm. right. who, right. who yeah, <laughs> provided as long as he was him for himself, coverage. He was allowed to do it. <laughs> right. And every time he, he um, paid off uh, a, a woman in one of those suits, um, then he was penalized in a graduated level, like like 50 grand, then 100 grand, then 200 grand yeah, to every time, you know, then, you know, million, two million, on, on, and on. But he was willing to keep harassing and assaulting women mm -hmm. because he knew that he had the bread right. to, one, pay off the women, but I would and like two, to pay see, those penalties. I'd like to see and, these and men as part of his contract. investigated and hold trial for what they did instead of, yeah. oh, well, we're going to fire you so right. you well, can go off some of these situations are criminal. It. If yeah. some of this stuff so, that Ma about Matt Lauer is true, I'm sorry. That's mm. criminal. Like the, the thing I, be I don't yeah, disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these so, folks should be in prison. I, you know, I, I don't mean, disagree. the woman comes into his office, but he it's locks tolerated the door by superiors. Via remote and control, that means and then she the leaves workplace the help is not of a, equal okay. of a, or a dignity for all. It has to go to the nurse. Well, I'm glad you know. to see a lot of agreement on this one, but we will move on to our final topic of the night. Um, actually, we'll take some questions from our viewers. And uh, let's take one from Edna Lawson, who asks on North Korea, who asks, when North Korea launches a missile, how do we know it's only a test and not a real attack? I mean, how are we going to respond to this now if, if the North Koreans can reach us? We track the trajectory of it. We have people watching it. Yeah, it seems like the, the administration was clear pretty early on that this was this high altitude test yeah. rather than something going And it's range. also aimed down into the ocean and not at us. You know, the question is, uh, do we have enough ground-based interceptors? You know, one terrible mistake the uh, Obama administration made was they stopped all the money for missile defense. Right. Now that's our best bet in this. Right. And we're yeah. behind the eight ball. And we think, you know, we've hit the last six tests in a row. Right. But, I mean... You know, well, it's we were not, spending it's, a lot of money. Yeah, President Obama cut the military. Okay. Yeah. And cut missile defense in yeah. particular. Why? Okay, well, well, he did not cut the military. And we have another question yeah. on the North Korean topic mm. and all. And uh, it's from Christopher Neal who says, if we believe the Kim regime is not suicidal, and I'm not sure everyone believes that, but that's the premise, then why are we so worried about their nuclear capability? I mean, are we sure that the Kim regime aren't? Yeah, I don't know if I accept system? the premise. No, I, you know, I, I don't think any, uh, you know, the regime, basically regime, the interest of a regime is staying in power. And the interest of having a nuclear weapon or having the ability to, to threaten with a nuclear capability is so you have your own security. So, you know, so far we've seen that if a nation has a nuclear weapon, nobody else messes with them on a certain level. So this gives them some security. So I don't think it's suicidal. I think, you know, it's, it's a security look that they want people to stay out of their business. And this is the way they're trying to do okay. it. And if we think about the yeah. previous question as well, yeah. the analysts are saying that for North Korea to truly become from a position of strength, if they're looking to, um, to negotiate, then they are going to have to, rather than fire one of these high altitude chests, do one at range towards the United States. And yes, hopefully, you know, they'll just shoot it into the sea, but I mean, that's a very dangerous situation, isn't it? Well, it is. You know, it's more right. being equal on your policy again. So it goes back to a global strategic policy. We don't want anyone having nuclear diplomacy. weapons, right? No, and I'm really, yeah, part of it is, is diplomacy in the toolbox, absolutely. But 
you can't look the other way from from Pakistan and you know and Indeed. and then decide to bomb Iran. You can't look the other way from Israel and decide that the North Koreans. You have to say, all right, that's enough for everybody. Right. In some respects, and what's that happening now is part of the thing is worse policy. than the Cold War. In some yeah, respects, right, yeah. In some respects, what's happening now is worse is than the Cold War. Cold War. It's, Cold War. It's, it's more in some respects, it's worse than the Cuban Missile mm -hmm. Crisis in 1962. People but are to go to the able question to of like the question the guy asked is like, are they are they sane? And Okay, so we've done this Eagle Falls exercise with the South Koreans every year since 1956, right? So if you think, you know, if, you know, if you're saying, you're saying, you know, that's 61 years, my math is right, and they've never done anything but their little exercises, you would just determine on the 61st year that, that those exercises are not a threat, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, they, they consider them a threat for this purpose, so... You know, I you know I don't know I don't know that you ever get beyond the fact that they're paranoid. I don't know that there's anything we can do that stops them from thinking like they do. So Patricia De Gennaro, you seem to be concerned that this could learn lead to proliferation in the region. How are we going to stop South Korea and Japan from deciding that well North Korea now well, has we bombs them, and we missiles? Them. That's how we do that. And how confident are you that they'll believe us? Japan and South Korea that will come oh, to the aid. I think that they're very confident. I think that they're working very closely with us. They're, you know, they're improving their own protection and their own security. And I, and also on the side, they, I mean, North and South Korea do have a dialogue. They do have engagement and they do have diplomacy that's going on and economic ties across borders. So those things will help reinforce, you know, the and dissuade. Okay. Well, it seems like we've had plenty I mean, we of do, discussion we do, of North Korea. We do Korea. have some back channels with them, too. Okay. The U.S. does. And, uh, well, we've talked plenty about North Korea, yeah. but now maybe perhaps we'll talk about some of the underreported stories of the week, which is our regular segment. And who would like to start? Brian, I'll go, go ahead. First. I'll go first. Uh, report out this week, the um, average temperature is growing up, going up 0 0.096 degrees per decade which means in 100 years, if there's no change in uh, the conditions that are going on now, there's no, we still have just as many cars burning just as dirty fuel, whatever, uh, it will go up 0.96. This is the third time in the last five years they've had to revise down their estimates of that because the global warming we were threatened has simply not materialized. Not as high as I missed that. Where did that? Where was that? Hey, from? That doesn't make any yeah. sense. Uh, from <laughs> Noah, Noah, and the IPCC. So the people on, uh, ostensibly on the other side of the of the thing. It's like it does it. What they have done is they've overestimated the effect carbon has on it. They've done this for decades, and they continue to do it. And until they realize that it's not as tied to carbon as they think it is, their models are going to continue to be far. They're far. Even the even the most uh, conservative models now are way high. Okay. Gregory Clay, what's your underreported story this week? Okay, I'll talk about Thursday night lights. We've all heard about Friday night lights. I'm talking uh, football, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. What else? Um, the book by Buzz Bissinger was turned into a movie, was turned into a TV show. This is Thursday night lights. Why? Because during segregation after Plessy versus Ferguson, when many states in this country, especially Texas, uh, when you had all black high schools, all white high schools, the black high schools couldn't play on Friday. They had to play on Thursday. There's a nice brand new book out about that, how stars were made on Thursday night lights. Bubba Smith, Mean Joe Green, Kenny Houston, Charlie Taylor, Emmett Thomas. I'll stop there. Who I've never heard of, sadly. So uh, you'll have to educate me later. But Patricia, what's yeah, your underreported story? My underreported story has to be Yemen, 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 and Yemen. It has to be the situation that's going on there, the continued destruction that's happening, the continued... Um, the humanitarian disaster that's happening there and the, and the way the Saudis are actually contributing to this and we are supporting that effort, the U.S., and I think that really needs to be looked at. Desperate conflict, certainly mm -hmm. underreported, but that is all for this week from us. I'm Adam Beer. Thanks for watching The Square Circle. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.